I really want to talk to you about memory. And I think there's a certain societal narrative, which I know you're keen to challenge, about what happens as we get older. You know, is it true that our memory declines as we get older? Well, you know, I think that globally, the, the societal narrative is that after you're born, you begin acquiring skills and abilities. You know, when you're an infant, you begin to learn to talk. And then when you're a toddler, you begin to crawl and walk and um, you learn to share when you're a young child. And, you know, it's it's a matter, you go to university or a trade school and you pick up a bunch of skills. Uh, and the idea is that you keep adding and adding and then at some point you start to fall off a precipice. Maybe it's 50, 60, 70, but, you know, depending on your own um, story that you hold in your head, that aging is accompanied by inevitable decline. And that's not true. Uh, the, the brain does slow down. It can take longer to solve problems or retrieve a word. But there's no evidence that most of us will experience a real memory deficit. Now, of course, Memory deficit is a hallmark of Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's is rarer than we appreciate or realize. Um, you can go through your 80s and 90s with no with no memory decrement, uh, apart from the fact that it might take you a little while longer to retrieve a memory. But if it was a memory impairment, you'd never get it. It would be lost. It just takes a little longer because of demyelination and other factors. So why is it then that so many of us think and take as fact that our memory declines as we get older? Well, I I don't know. I think um, part of it is that the story was developed for the way we lived maybe 40 years ago. We're living longer and healthier than ever before. When my grandfather was 65 in 1966, he wasn't particularly healthy. Uh, right. A 65-year-old today is, in general, much healthier. Uh, he had been, um, he, Everybody he knew, he was a doctor. They all smoked. Uh, I mean, in fact, you know, at least in the U.S., there were ads that doctors would recommend smoking, yeah. that they were good for your brain. You know, it's just it is so crazy to think of that now, isn't it? I mean, yeah. but that wasn't that long ago, really. No, it wasn't. Um, and I think that you know the way that older adults are portrayed in the, in movies and in jokes is that they're doddering and that they are losing their memories. It, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, doesn't it? In the sense that if that's what the movies are telling you and that's what media is telling you, and then let's say you're in your late 40s or early 50s and you forget something, you then will say to yourself, well, oh, that's because I'm getting older. And it almost is reinforcing that belief. And is that part of the problem? Like, rather than actually, I think there's an example you use either in the book or in an interview I've heard you say before that we just create a different narrative around it when we're older. Yeah, so I you know I I I teach college students and 19-year-olds are uh, very forgetful. They lose their cell phones and their keys. They forget their computer passwords. This happens to 79-year-olds too. Uh but the story is different. When a 19-year-old you know, has one of these memory lapses, lost my cell phone, can't find it. They just say, oh, I, I've got to get more sleep or uh, I've got too much on my plate. The 79-year-old or even 59-year-old says, it's Alzheimer's, I know it, Thing, it's, it's downhill from here. Part of the problem is that um, if you forget something and you obsess about it or stress about it, that's going to release cortisol and adrenaline, which are going to shut your memory down and they make it even worse. So if you're trying to find a word and you're just beating yourself up and say, oh, I, I have it here, it's, you know, uh, that's the worst thing you can do. It's better to let go. Now, we, we do know that when older adults have this memory lapse or delay in getting word or a name. It's not actually the concept that they've forgotten. It's what's called the, um, the phonological word form, that peculiar set of vowels and consonants that represent the word. That's what you lose. And there's a very particular area of the brain that um, is a little bit decremented as we get older. So, um, you might know that you're thinking of a flower and you can picture it and you know its use, but you can't get the name gladiola, but sooner or later you'll get it. It's that, and you might even know it starts with G, it's uh, four syllables. I mean, we've had this tip of the tongue kind of a phenomenon, uh, but 
the uh, the proof that it's not really a memory deficit per se is that you get it eventually, and and you know just don't stress out about it. Let it let it go. I mean, can we train that to be better? Let's say we we're thinking of that flower. We can't think of gladiola. Is there something we can do to make it more likely that we can think of the word? We don't know, uh, other than just letting go uh, yeah. and and moving on. It's not that most of the time it's not that important that you get exactly the yeah. right word. And I think that's important, isn't it? That whole idea that that really circles back to something you said right at the start of this conversation about um, you know, as long as you, I think you said something about diet. You don't, don't stress about it too much, and you're saying now when you stress about it and you release cortisol, cortisol in itself, when you know, too much of it for too long a period of time will be detrimental to your memory. So chronic stress is detrimental to your brain, right? Absolutely. It's, 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 an, I mean, we've been listing big killers. Chronic stress, uh, is, is a huge killer. Uh, yeah. The, the fact is though, you do need a little bit of stress. Yeah. Um, stress is actually neuroprotective and it kickstarts the immune system. Um, the, this is why I say, you know, if you if you retire from something, you should retire to something else. You need the modicum of stress that requires you to get up out of bed in the morning and groom yourself and go be with other people and make some work product that's got a deadline. All these things are important as long as they're not stressing you out completely. Uh, without that small amount of stress, we often see a, a great decline in mental and physical health. But yes, chronic, is, it's like with everything in the body, there's this Goldilocks zone. Yeah. You, you know, too little is no good, too much is no good. You've got to come right, just yeah. right in the middle. You know, what? I, I teach um, a course that I created with with uh, some colleagues of mine called Prescribing Lifestyle Medicine, a accredited course that we teach to, you know, GPs and specialists and other healthcare professionals about the science of various lifestyle factors and how we can use them to help our patients. And I, I show this graph, uh, I think it's from a 2015 journal. I can't remember the name, the learning memory. I, I can't remember the name of the journal. But again, well, there is a, a journal of learning and memory. I think it's it, one of I our think, big journals. I think it's that one. And there's this beautiful graph showing stress's impact on the brain. And how, again, it's that, you know, you start off, as stress increases, your brain function is improved. Um, but then you start to get diminishing returns and then it, it starts to become detrimental. And we know that, you know, chronic stress, you know, kills nerve cells in the hippocampus and memory center of the brain. So as you say, it is that Goldilocks zone. You need enough to get you engaged in life, but not so much that you're worrying about every little thing. I think you, you, you actually mentioned in the book, don't you? People who ruminate a lot, that go over and over things and worry and, and um, become anxious about it. You're saying that actually makes your body awash with those stress hormones that can actually be detrimental to aging well. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, super, super interesting. And, like and, and the, um, the stress hormones not only uh, damage cells in the hippocampus, they damage your microbiota in the gut. They get it out of balance, and you know your microbiome is is creating ninety five percent of the serotonin that ends up in your brain, and doing all other kinds of things in terms of immune function. Yeah, I mean it's incredible. Um, I mean, Dan, there is so much that we could talk about. Going back to before before we close it off um, with some really practical tips for people. Um, you know, one thing I, I really was absorbed with in your book was that was the stuff on pain and i think you quote a statistic saying that pain is the source of 80 percent of doctor visits in the u.s or something yeah. like that which yeah. which was really staggering and it's interesting also that the way we treat pain today is basically the same way we've treated it for two thousand years with the bark of a tree aspirin or it's it's synthetic equivalents or the seed of a poppy Opiates yeah. and their synthetic equivalents. We we have not made advances in two thousand years. Well, I wonder if that's because we're looking at it maybe through the wrong lens. And what I mean by that is, um, you say in your book that pain and, that, and why this is so important is we're talking about health span versus lifespan. Sure, you can live to hundred, but if your last ten years are in chronic pain, you know that is going to influence the quality of your life and how much enjoyment you get and what you're going to get out of that life. And you say that. 
Pain is influenced by cultural, environmental, historical, and cognitive factors. Isn't that interesting? So in the yes. U.S., doctors all know, especially ER doctors, emergency room doctors, you call them something else here, I think. Yeah, well, A&E or A &E, emergency yeah. departments. Yeah. All of them know that if you're a member of a certain cultural or uh, ethnic group, on the standard pain scale of 1 to 10, if you say that your pain is 3, and you remember this particular group, they prepare the operating table. These are people who uh, are not um, accustomed to expressing pain. We, you know, zero is no pain, 10 is a lot of pain. If they say three, it's time to prep the operating room. There are other people who they'll say they have a nine, and it means you can, you know, just let them sit in the waiting room for a few hours. Yeah. There are these different ways we have of being in the world that are cultural. And, and, and I guess in many levels, pain... Well, not many levels. Pain is subjective, right? So oh, it's absolutely that. Yeah. So, so therefore, if we're using a subjective scale, naught to ten, to tell the doctor in front of us or the healthcare professional how much pain we're in, of course, my three may be different from your three. Well, absolutely, and you know, and and it, it's it's a matter of uh, context. So if I'm hiking and I've got a rock in my shoe and it keeps pressing on this part of my foot, I'm really annoyed, and I'll I'll stop and take the rock out. Uh, but I might pay 40 quid to go to a massage therapist to press on exactly that part of my foot. And give you the same level of pain. So it could be, let's say, a seven with a rock. It could be a seven with a, with a, with a vigorous and strong massage, but you, you will interpret that differently, won't you? Oh, this is good for me because there's tension here that the massage therapist is releasing as opposed to, oh, something's there. And I guess in a nutshell, we could do two hours on just pain alone. It's, it's that complex because there is, it's very clear now, isn't it? It's, it's not just, it's just, certainly not just mechanical at all. There are emotional, uh, stress, psychosocial components Absolutely. to do with pain, which makes it very challenging to treat um, for some people. But it's interesting, quite a lot of my talks, um, both for doctors and the public, I've had chronic pain consultants come along and I've often had chats with them afterwards. And they've said to me, you know, Ronga, we really like um, a lot of your work and a lot of the books because we can use these tools with our patients with chronic pain, because ultimately we realize that the medications, often they don't work. Um, we Sometimes they do, of course, as well, but it's really fascinating, this whole idea of pain. Um, you know, how come you wrote a chapter on pain? Well, um, again, I think part of it was that um, a lot of what we know about pain hasn't trickled down to the average person. A lot yeah. of it came out of McGill, where I uh, ran a lab for 20 years, yeah. from Ron Melzack. And in fact, I include the Melzack pain scale in the book, because if people can refer to it before they go to see their doctor or go to the A&E, um, they're using the terms that doctors might be expecting them to use. Uh, for example, is the pain stabbing or is it dull? Is it yeah. uh, focused or is it, um, is it based on pressure or based on uh, laceration, these kinds of things? But the other reason I wrote about it is that, again, part of this societal narrative is that as we age, we're going to be miserable and in pain. And actually, the available evidence is that, yes, we do get aches and pains, and they get worse and worse, and then they start getting better. There's a point of inflection, it depends on the person, but around 75 or 80, our, our, the aches and pains somehow disappear for many of us or become manageable. Yeah, and that's, that's a very optimistic note. Um, which is a, it's a great way to start ending this conversation that I've really, really enjoyed. And I wish we did have another two hours. Me too. Um, you mentioned, I think, another, another very exciting statistic is that 82 is the happiest age statistically. That's what I read in your book. Yeah. Incredible. I mean, so that gives us, for anyone who's listening to this podcast or watching on YouTube right now, who is under the age of 82, which is probably many, if the majority certainly, I, I would guess. Um, that's pretty exciting. It means our, our happiest days are still to come, right? And I think we can push that out another 10 or 20 years if we can get rid of ageism and treat older adults with more dignity and respect, not allow them to fall into complacency and learned helplessness. I think yeah. 82 is, is movable. Yeah. Well, I love that, Dan. I absolutely love that. And um you know, I always like to close off the conversations with tips for people. So, um, the podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of life. And I think the tips that you are 
you know, the habits you're talking to people about in your book, yes, it's going to help them age better, but it's also going to help them feel better today. Yeah, agreed. And that's what's really exciting. So I wonder, you know, you've done a lot of talks, you've been on a book tour for over two months now. Um, from everything that you have put into this book, from all the feedback you've had at events, you know, what are some of your top four or five tips that people can think about applying into their everyday lives immediately to improve the way that they feel? Well, follow healthy practices, uh, a moderate diet. There's no one diet that's been clearly shown superior to the others. The Mediterranean diet, the keto, the paleo, none of them have panned out, you know, statistically or research-wise. And, and actually, as you say, and we didn't get a chance to cover this, but you say, as I absolutely agree with, that often it's more important what you don't eat than what you do eat. Right. Uh, don't eat heavily processed foods. And it's also more important than we realized when you eat. Yeah. Uh, your metabolism is linked to your biological clock, that funnily named suprachiasmatic nucleus. And if you eat at the same time every day, you're going to digest the food and draw the nutrients out of it more completely. Yeah. Um, so moderated lifestyle in terms of diet, eat more plants than you usually do probably, but a varied diet uh, and um, get a good night's sleep um, and movement, which I see as the imprisoned corollary of exercise. It's not about whether you get an extra 20 minutes on the treadmill. It's about whether you actually get outside and move your whole body, uh, yeah. especially in nature. So that's three things. Uh, the healthy practices of diet, exercise, and sleep. Yeah. And then I would uh, talk about mindset, yeah. trying to cultivate curiosity, openness to new experience, conscientiousness, and resilience. And then the final thing, number five, is to associate with new people, especially younger people as you get older. Keep your social networks, and I don't mean your digital ones, I mean your in-person ones, going, because that is really an important part of uh, brain health and brain happiness. If you enjoyed that short clip, I think you are really going to enjoy the full conversation, which you can check out here.